All right. So <clears throat> what is Sybase? Um, I think probably a lot of people, if you've been following us at all, might relate to Sybase as like a blockchain. Uh, I think that's not quite right. And it's not, it's not even quite right, I would say, to think of Sybase as just a blockchain framework or a blockchain platform. Um, it includes a blockchain as one of the components, but I do think of Sybase and I think it's it's most accurate to think of Sybase as a more general application deployment framework. Uh, so that's what we are trying to develop with Sybase. And uh, that might lead to the question then, what is the problem? Why do we need a new application deployment framework? And don't our current systems solve what we need them to solve? So I think there's a lot of problems with the current way that we deploy applications. Hopefully I'll convince you that there's some problems. Um, the, the three that I want to point out are centralization, poor user experience, and poor developer experience. And I'll start with centralization. Um, centralization, if you don't already have a good intuition for why centralization is a problem, that's probably a whole talk in and of itself. Uh, I went into it a little bit in my last talk about uh, blockchain and why blockchain is relevant. But just to briefly touch on two pieces of centralization that are worth caring about, I want to talk about architectural centralization and political centralization. Um, architectural centralization is when you, uh, as the name suggests, have centralization in the architecture or in the actual nodes. So maybe you have a single node or a single server that's hosting all of the uh, content for various applications. And when you have that kind of architectural centralization, that is a central point of failure. So if that server goes down, all the applications and their state goes down and you don't have access, um, or if one gets hacked and uh, potentially there's a data breach, then you could expose the data of users across various applications. Um, that's what it means to have architectural centralization and the, the risk that that poses. Um, political centralization might be a little less familiar to people. Um, if you ask uh, some people, certainly myself, I think it's potentially the more nefarious type of centralization, which is, um, it's really when you have centralization in the entities who have control over let's say the state of the data in an application. And so um, you, you really want many independent entities to be uh, responsible for providing the infrastructure that applications are deployed to. And it's, a, it's more of a long-term problem. You don't see immediate problems with that, but you have this long-term risk associated with uh, all of the world's applications running on infrastructure that is controlled by only a few entities. And, it's a more fragile system in that case. You, if you have corruption among uh, only a few people in the worst case, you may have privacy breaches and people that are able to make use of your data that's stored with all these applications. Um, and, and there's other types of problems that um, political centralization poses as well that I'm, I'm not gonna go too deep on here. Um, so with those types of centralization, I think there's really three areas that are I want to think about, and that's um, centralization with the database itself, centralization with the API providers, centralization with the front end. So where front ends are stored, uh, where they're served from, those are all central points of failure, places where there is a lot of political centralization. Blockchain addresses some of that. And blockchain tends to address the, the database layer in particular. It's um, both architectural and more or less political decentralization of the database layer, but doesn't traditionally address centralization around API provision or, or front ends. Um, so uh, that's, that's one category of problem. Um, another one is the uh, is user experience. Um, yeah, there, I guess there's a lot of user experience problems. I could, I, we could talk about traditional user experience problems, but I want to focus on Web three or the the user experience problems that 
particularly come from if you're trying to address centralization and so maybe you introduce shared state into your application or state that's stored on a blockchain somewhere you typically by doing that also introduce a lot of issues with user experience the, the one that i'd say is the oldest and people are most familiar with is simply the the rate of um information propagation it might take a while for a transaction to go through. Um, this is more true in Bitcoin or Ethereum, let's say, where you, you submit a transaction, you have to wait a while where people are used to in the web two or traditional application space, being able to have instant interactions. Um, so that's a an issue with user experience that some blockchains try to address by pumping up their throughput of transactions, which is, it, it does to some extent address that issue. Um, another issue with immersion and user experience is the fact that, I mean, we've all gotten used to it at this point, if you're a user of Web3 applications, which is you try to do almost anything and you get a pop-up from MetaMask or some authenticator asking you to uh, authenticate the, the payload that's going to be submitted to the chain. Um, and that is a very unique thing in the Web3 space. And it's something people are not used to, don't exactly know how to deal with. A lot of people, I would say, the majority of end users who are not necessarily technically savvy or don't really know what they're doing, they're going to see it, that pop up and effectively just approve it. And that's a, that's, that's a problem. That's a security problem. It's potentially a privacy issue. Um, in fact, the public blockchain space has, I mean, it's not private, <laughs> it's public. And so uh, that is maybe something that we don't talk about enough, which is that all of our data is public. You, you might think you're using a, a chain pseudonymously or anonymously, but um, if an identity is ever tied to your on-chain identity, your, your, your real life identity is tied to your on-chain identity, you've now, painted a glorious picture and history of all of your interactions with all the various applications you use. Uh, so it's very, um, it has the potential to expose a lot more information than you want just by thinking maybe what you have is a false sense of security or anonymity when you're using these applications. Uh, and the last thing I'll talk about is the poor developer experience. Um, if you've not deployed an application, you'll identify less with this, but yeah, typically if you're deploying an application, you might have a server and you have Node.js running, you have some code that serves web pages, it responds to HTTP requests, it uh, does read and write queries to some database, typically a SQL database. If you're tacking a blockchain on here, then the process is even more complicated and you're synchronizing with, a, with a, another database or a shared database. Um, it's it's quite a process. And, and if you want any kind of redundancy, now maybe you're talking about containerizing your app over multiple servers and you're getting into Kubernetes and um, a lot of other technologies and it's just difficult. So you, you quickly realize you, you almost have to be a system administrator expert to be able to do all of this yourself. And so most people don't. Most people just say, I will pay somebody else's to use somebody else's infrastructure, um, which is fine. I mean, that solves a lot of the developer experience problems, but then it's now reintroducing uh, political centralization issues. And um, so, uh, yeah, is there anything to be done about that? I, I would argue that there is, and there's actually ways we can address all three of these. Hello? Hi. Uh, hi. No? I, I want to mention, yes. I want to mention that about 30 years ago, I used to be a sysadmin. I used to run the, uh, big databases. And because it was more than uh, 15 years uh, since I've set up a database, I'm outdated. I understand what all of that is. And I still wouldn't go about doing it. And if I, even if I did it, and if I did de deploy it to a server, it still wouldn't be decentralized. It still wouldn't have redundancy. 
Right. So we're talking here about an operating system that's a completely new concept, even for people who do understand everything yep. that's happening in the background. And we need to have solutions for those things. I, I completely agree. And I totally hear your pain and it's a lot to keep up with. Um, yeah, I, I totally hear you now. That, that is, uh, I hope to convince you that we're trying to address many of those things. Um, I, I am convinced. I joined this group because it's one of the few places that I see people talking about things that I don't think they all, it, it's not my pain, it's the, the growing pains of the whole human race, yep. in a sense. Yeah, I, and, I totally agree with you. Um, and, and hey, no, to no, go no, through I'm, them. I'm going to continue on with the talk, but uh, hold your questions yeah. and stuff till the end. I'll have like a live Q&A at the end and we can uh, we can chat and discuss that more. Um, all right, so uh, to to solve some of these issues, I want to introduce uh, Sybase to you all. So uh, what is it? Um, and yeah, there's a lot that I could talk about here. Um, but I want to focus on these couple things, um, at least at first. So I want to give you a high level overview of Sybase and um, blockchain services, authenticated front ends, client side services. What are all these things? Um, I've said already that Sybase includes a blockchain. Um, and yeah, we, we think that's the right move. To a, a blockchain really does, in many important ways, address architectural and political centralization. Uh, so that, that architecture seems right and it's worth uh, keeping. So we have a blockchain and we have some one principle that we are using as we architect our blockchain is a, a desire to make the client, the native client, the executable code that's running on a server, for example, to be as thin and simple as possible. You really want the complexity and the customization and parameterization of your blockchain to as much as possible exist uh, in the smart contracts or the services that are in the blockchain itself so that you can use all the synchronization capabilities that the blockchain provides you for coming to consensus on the uh, parameters of the blockchain itself. So um, to give you an example or a couple examples of how far we're pushing that in Sybase, we even, we have, um, for example, custom author authorization for accounts. So if you have an account uh, on a Sybase deployment, it should be the case that you can write your own smart contract or service that defines exactly how you want your account to be authorized. That includes, it could include normal public key cryptography, public private key cryptography that you're all familiar with. It could include um, time locks or multi-signature authentication or whatever a developer can dream up for how to authorize an account. It is um, fully programmable inside it. So this is, it, it's not very opinionated at the native layer for exactly how you need to authenticate your accounts. It's all um, programmable in services, including even the signature verification itself. Um, and this is something I, I haven't seen many others doing. Um, and so what, what we're doing is even putting signature verification in smart contracts, in services, and it's executing in like a, a, a WebAssembly virtual machine. So there's a performance hit there, sure. Um, but what does it mean? It means if you want to use ECDSA curves or BLS curves for aggregate signatures or some other signature scheme for your zero knowledge proof application or whatever it is, uh, you can go ahead and do that. You can use a curve that somebody has implemented or you can implement your own and you can plow ahead without having to wait for the uh, native layer of the chain to upgrade and give you that capability. So it is maximally flexible um, at the cost of some performance, but we think it is the right trade-off. Uh, and 
So that's what I'm talking about here when I say a thin native client. We're really trying to push as much as we can to blockchain state. Um, another feature I just want to point out is a, a queryable event history. This is a problem that um, many blockchains that try to push the limits on throughput and such, have, you have a, a history problem where your history size explodes and the queryability of that history is terrible or difficult. Um, and so we have this concept of events that you can emit in Sybase services or smart contracts where um, emitting events is how you essentially, as an application developer, define what data it is that is relevant to your application, what historical data. And you can define custom indices on that historical data so that querying that data for your application is extremely efficient. And Ethereum has something like this. I think in Ethereum you can uh, define three custom indices, if I recall correctly. Um, so it's similar in Sybase. In Sybase, there's no limit. You can define as many custom indices on your on your historical data as you want. Um, and that's our, our event system. Uh, so another um, thing I want to talk about is services. And I've probably been saying services already here in this talk. What I mean by services is basically smart contracts. Um, we just call them services because they they do more than what you are used to uh, if you come from a another blockchain ecosystem. Um, they can do all the things normal smart contracts can do and you update state and you define actions. You can call those actions. Uh, but they can do other things too. They can handle HTTP requests. They can serve web pages. Um, we even have the libraries written to allow your smart contracts, your services to uh, resolve GraphQL queries. And um, so there's quite a lot of innovation happening there in our concept of these extended smart contracts or services. And what that does is, excuse me, uh, it reduces the burden on uh, running infrastructure. So if you're an app developer, the service in Sybase is kind of like a replacement for that Node.js layer if you are having a, like in a traditional application stack and it's fully programmable, right? So you can just write your service and that does the HTTP request handling can update the database. It, all, all of that can now happen just in the service. And so instead of having to run your infrastructure to do that piece and connect it to a blockchain, the Sybase package is all of that. So you're just running Sybase and, and you, as an app developer, don't even need to run it. You can use somebody else's infrastructure without introducing logical centralization, be, ideally, because the, the Sybase deployment could be decentralized. Um, so that is quite cool and improves the developer experience quite a lot, I would say. Um, all right. This is a potentially a big one. Um, authenticated front end. Uh, why is it that when a front end submits a payload to MetaMask, let's say, MetaMask can't just sign the payload and submit it to the chain silently? The reason you can't do that is because you don't trust the front end, right? That you could that would introduce all kinds of security vulnerabilities if MetaMask just blindly signed stuff and submitted it. Uh, so. The reason, uh, that's the reason why you have to have manual confirmation that yes, I as a user am confirming that I want to sign this transaction and approve this action being taken on my behalf on chain. The problem with that is, as I alluded to before, users generally don't know what they're approving. And there might be some power users who understand what's being presented to them. They maybe even can go read the open source code. Hopefully it is open source and they can see what it is that this action is doing. But for the vast majority of people, you actually are just going to approve that pop-up to the extent that you trust the front end uh, that you're using. And so notice that circularity there. You don't trust the front end, so you pop up this pop-up to the user, but the user is essentially approving that pop-up proportional to how much they trust the front end. 
So what this implies is you can't really get away from the fact that the front end is the thing that the users trust, right? And so for that reason, we're kind of starting from there with Sybase. Front ends are served from the chain effectively. So you're, you store the front ends on the chain, you serve them from the chain, and they are, they're even served in a kind of, uh, we don't have a name for it yet, but there's kind of like an operating system layer that's served alongside the, the front end that is among other things, an authenticator. It knows what the, like where that front end came from, what service, so it can just silently sign for transactions that that front end is pushing to its own service because it knows that that front end is approved. The front end is essentially an extension of the service. So just as the service on chain would not have to ask your permission to update the state, its own state, the front end, which is now authenticated and tied to that service does not need to ask the user. So this, this architecture removes the vast majority of pop-ups that users experience when they're dealing with Web3 applications because, um, yeah, it because of what I said. So it, it's quite a bit more immersive and actually quite a bit more secure. Can uh, I and it has its, um, note down your question, Noam. I, I will. Uh, I want to hear your question, uh, but let me just get to the end. I might even answer it. Um, uh, but yeah, please, please wait till the end. Um, but yeah, it's quite a big benefit to immersion and security. And there are trade-offs there. It's it's complicated in some other ways, but we think those this is the right set of trade-offs. This is the way that it should be, um, and and aligns much more closely with how users expect the internet to work. Um, so uh, that's authenticated front ends. And the last piece here I want to talk about is client side services. This is really just an extension of authenticated front ends. It's the generalized concept that we realized that. What we have here is code that can run in on the client side, in the client's browser, that is in some sense uh, trusted or it's 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 linked to the on-chain service. So basically this allows you to define client side services. It's almost like this is why smart contracts is not a good word for it. Services really is a better word. You can define client side services that can do things for the user. Maybe it's calling the, the equivalent service on chain to update chain state silently. Maybe it's not. Maybe it's just updating local client state and browser storage. Um, and maybe it's doing some computation on the client side. So what you start to see here is you can put, we can push computation and state management and storage out to the edge. We can push it out to the client. So this not only improves scalability of the chain because now you're making use of, of client hardware, um, but you're also, uh, um, what was I gonna say? <laughs> I just lost it. Uh, oh, it, it improves privacy. It helps with privacy because let's say you have like a um, a contact list or something, right? That that you, you wanna store. You might not want that on chain, right? You might not want, the world to know who are the other accounts that are my friends or whom I'm interacting with um, or whatever. It could be something else, but let's say you have a contact list. You could now store that client side rather than chain side and other apps that want to make use of that, um, that contact list. Maybe a game wants to know who to recommend for you to friend in the game, right? They can make use of the contact list application um, by just client side communication between those apps. It, it never needs to ask the chain. Um, so this really is a, it's kind of a new paradigm that we have to wrap our heads around, but it, the, the capability with Sybase is now here to have this kind of client side service and these, these client side operations, uh, which is pretty cool. And I'm excited about it, can't tell. Uh, all right, and then I'm gonna breeze through one slide here on various other technologies that Sybase introduces. Um, this is more for the engineers who might listen to this. I want to just uh, briefly touch on various other innovations that we have that I think are cool. Um, 
First one is, uh, is Trident. It's the name of our new database. So we have a very highly performant database. Um, it's an on-disk uh, database. Um, this is the database that underlies the blockchain that interacts with the file system and such. So it's an on-disk database, configurable in-memory cache, um, multi-threaded reads. Um, we have a, a specification for IPFS integration with Sybase such that you can have um, on-chain billing that is linked to storage done with IPFS on the same infrastructure provider as chain storage. Uh, the reason you want that is because of this architecture where we have front ends deployed on chain um, and other files, right? There's other assets that might be associated with the front end that you want to store on chain and they might be big and they might not be able to fit in a single block. You might time out if you're just trying to submit the whole payload in a transaction to the chain. So this enables large file uploads and downloads. You can declare what file you're uploading and you can pay for it, and then you can do an upload session through IPFS and just pay for it on chain. So we have a, the beginnings of, of that technology being built. Um, we have a new binary format or data serialization format that we call FRACPAC. So it's extremely efficient packing and unpacking of data. You can even read the data without necessarily unpacking it. Um, and we use that for uh, like service to service communication or even that's also the format we use when we're sending data to and from clients. Um, we use ESVM. Uh, ESVM is a very high performance a uh, WebAssembly virtual machine uh, ori originally introduced for the EOS blockchain or the Antelope ecosystem. And uh, we make use of that because it's an extremely high performance VM. Um, we have modified it a little bit, uh, which I'll talk about in a second. The fact that we're using WebAssembly uh, is important. It means we can support multiple languages, any languages that compile to WebAssembly, which is many. Uh, today we support C++ and we have partial support for Rust services. Um, but uh, yeah, we, we expect Rust to be eventually a first class citizen, just like C++, and we will potentially extend to other languages in the future. Uh, the modifications we've made to the ESVM are primarily the uh, uh, SIMD support. So we have 128-bit SIMD instruction support, and that is particularly important for things like, because we want uh, custom curves like signature verification to be done in WebAssembly. Uh, you kind of want SIMD as a way to accelerate those computations to offset the performance that you're having just by executing signature verification in WASM in the first place. Um, so we have that. Uh, we also have uh, various innovations in on-chain governance. On-chain governance really does seem to be um, this is obviously a big argument whether you want on or off chain governance in the blockchain space. We tend to think that the transparency and permissionlessness, the fact that anybody can participate if subject to whatever the rules are of the on chain governance, that those properties make on chain governance uh, desirable. Um, on chain governance does not necessarily mean coin voting, which is what most people associate with on chain governance. There's that whole space, I think, is actually ripe for disruption and innovation. And, and um, we, we think we have uh, a lot of improvements in our on-chain governance system that we're kind of developing in parallel with the rest of this infrastructure. Um, one of the benefits you get from on-chain governance, stronger on-chain governance and neutral, trustable on-chain governance, you can actually allow your community of any size to reach a consensus on subjective matters, right? If you actually trust the system of governance, you can you can allow the community to reach consensus on subjective matters. And this is actually quite a deep point. It, it's like there are services that you might want uh, infrastructure providers to provide, but they're not objectively or deterministically verifiable. Um, like uh, making like API access, for example, or giving access to a transaction log history or something. And because they're not deterministically verifiable, you can't deterministically enforce them or incentivize that or um, or otherwise enforce that. So what that means is 
communities need to be able to, they need to plan for being able to reach consensus on subjective matters if indeed you want to have any kind of incentive or enforcement around these um, non-deterministic services. And yeah, so that's one of the reasons why you, we focus so much on our, our on-chain governance. Um, it also enables IBC. Um, I'll, I think all I'll say about this is IBC, people often think of as just a technical challenge, trying to get different chains and different protocols to communicate. It's actually more than just a technical challenge. There's an economics challenge here too, because the, the security of any communication between chains is only as strong as the weakest link there. And so if, the, if there's a low threshold of attack on one of the chains, you can seriously disrupt obviously that chain, but now also all the chains that have connected with that uh, chain. So uh, we believe our on-chain governance innovations and in general innovations in on-chain governance that raise that threshold of attack go a long way to helping the whole industry move forward with inner blockchain communication because you improve the security of everyone. Um, all right, so I, I know I just, Blew through that, but that's my that's the extent of my deeper dive on the, the innovations in Sybase. And I have uh, this one slide left, which is about the future of Sybase. Um, yeah, the, so certainly we're going to be looking to have private deployments of Sybase. So for uh, people or projects that are interested in using it for just local application deployment, because it's just a good infrastructure for app deployment. Um, the, the public deployments are kind of a question mark at this point. Obviously, there, I've talked a lot about public blockchains and how this might apply in public scenarios. Uh, and that's all true. It's just there's a difficult regulatory environment right now in the US. And so for us being a US-based company, uh, it is the, the current state of things is that we don't want to be associated with a public deployment because it's too, basically the development of Sybase is, is too centralized right now uh, under our organization. And so there's too, too much risk for the organization to be associated with any particular public deployment uh, at risk of being considered, you know, like an issuer or something of any securities or tokens on that, on that blockchain. Um, which I guess leads into the third point there, which is to decentralize the development. So Sybase, the protocol, right? The, 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 just the protocol of how all of this works um, I guess ideally, I, I, want, I would want to see a future where uh, Fractally and our organization is really one of many contributors to the vision. Uh, and obviously this is gonna take, it takes a long time. It takes a lot longer for the grassroots movement to start around some particular technology, um, which is why most people don't do it. Most people do have centralized um, development teams that push forward a particular technology and they try to decentralize later. Uh, I think we want to take the reverse approach, which is really to decentralize first. So um, decentralize the, the development of the protocol itself, then even the technology, if there's other engineers that can contribute, our code, our code is all open source. And upon actually decentralizing such that we're not really the, the stakeholders in the project, I think that, yeah, that greatly improves the probability that we could have uh, some kind of public deployment that everybody can can benefit from in the future. Um, so that is basically it. And I I know Noam and other people have some questions. So I will now.